thanks very much, first of all, for the uh, invitation at the workshop and also for being here at least until 5 o'clock, which is a heavy job. Okay, so the, in any case, uh, this is a joint work with Riccardo Montalto, currently at Zurich University. And, uh, okay, so the, the, the system is the, the same that was described yesterday by Jean-Marc. So our, uh, the Euler equation for a fluid, B-dimensional fluid, and the periodic boundary conditions, let be Y. So the, 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 the fluid is below <coughs> the graph Y is equal eta of X. It is ruled by the Euler equations. And uh, in the case of uh, any rotational uh, velocity field, one discard uh, the <coughs> velocity field has the gradient of uh, phi, which is a velocity potential. If the fluid is assumed to be incompressible, hence uh, it is an harmonic function. Under the action, so here we put uh, infinite uh, depth, could be done as also with finite depth, but here it is. And uh, then, uh, okay, uh, there is a, it, it is uh, the fluid that moves uh, under the action of gravity, and then, uh, which is G, and then there are surface tension, so there is capillarity effects at the free surface. And so, as this was discussed yesterday, the Euler equation becomes, uh, boils down to this uh, Bernoulli equation, the pressure, the continuity of the pressure at the free surface. And then uh, one also assumes uh, the last equation, uh, which is a kinematic condition, which tells that the particles which originally were in the fluid on the surface uh, remains forever on the surface, so there are no breaks of the, of the, uh, in the wave. Uh, and of course, so the unknowns uh, is uh, to know how the fluids evolve, and so the, to know its uh, velocity potential phi. And uh, this is, uh, as it was uh, reminded yesterday, so it's an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. The canonical variables are the, um, the graph, so the function eta of x, and uh, the trace at the boundary of the velocity potential. And uh, in fact, uh, if our one knows uh, the eta, so the shape domain, uh, the domain occupied by the fluid, and then if one knows uh, the value at the boundary of the velocity potential, one uh, solves, uh, finds the harmonic, uh, unique harmonic function in the domain occupied by the fluid with uh, these boundary conditions. And uh, we shall follow uh, the uh, zakharov craig slam formulation, which is uh, this one. So eta and psi evolves, uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's the Hamiltonian formulation, Eta and Psi, this is the, evolve has the, this Hamiltonian system. It's uh, the L2 gradient of the Hamiltonian, which uh, uh, turns out to be expressed as it was seen yesterday by the Dirichlet Neumann operator of the surface applied to Psi, which is a linear operator in Psi. And then there is the second equation, which is uh, on the contrary, quite uh, longer. And uh, the, the Hamiltonian, it is what one should expect, namely the Hamiltonian is the full energy of the system expressed only through these canonical variables, which are eta and psi. So it is the kinetic energy of the fluid that uh, when expressed uh, in terms of the Dirichlet Neumann operator takes uh, this form. Then there is the gravitational energy and then there is the energy due to the capillary forces. Okay, so uh, uh, in fact, uh, this system uh, has, uh, it's an Hamiltonian system, uh, but it has also other uh, symmetries. One, uh, it is that it's a reversible system. It's a reversible system uh, from the point of view of the Hamiltonian uh, um, meaning. It simply means that the Hamiltonian is uh, even in the potential psi. This is the symmetry. Extremely simple, but quite uh, important, as we all have also seen yesterday. And uh, so the, the Hamiltonian H is uh, invariant, left invariant by this, uh, the action of this uh, symmetry, which is uh, this involution. S squared simply changes the sign of Psi. 
and uh, then uh, it is natural to look uh, to solutions which are reversible, namely so that are uh, in time uh, are even and that in space, in, uh, sorry, in the first component, which is the space, are even in time and in the, the velocity potential, in time is an odd function. So in particularly at the time t is equal to zero, the velocity potential is zero, as it was said yesterday. Then uh, <coughs> another property is that the um, water waves vector field leaves invariant the subspace of functions which are even in x. So if uh, this, uh, this subspace is left invariant, and uh, we shall confine to this case. So these, fun these functions are, so for us, uh, always uh, are, uh, we shall take functions which are even in x. In this case, uh, all, also the velocity potential phi is uh, even in x, and hence uh, its uh, velocity, the x component of the velocity field, namely so phi x, uh, is odd in x, and so it vanishes at x is equal to zero, and because of two pi periodicity, it also vanishes at x is equal to pi. And so the situation is that uh, physically the fluid has the the velocity field whose component, uh, the x component uh, when x is equal to zero always vanishes. So the, it is like this, there is no flux of energy of uh, fluid here. The same happens because of uh, oddness and two pi periodicity at uh, x is equal to pi. And then uh, <coughs> this, uh, the problem that we are studying physically, it means that uh, really there is no flux of uh, fluid at, at the at the walls x is equal 0, x is equal pi, and so we really we are studying the standing waves, so is the evolution of a fluid we confine it between two walls. Uh, and so, okay, uh, these are... Then, uh, as we said yesterday, okay, the mass is a prime integral, then in the case of infinite fluid there is also another peculiarity. In any case, so we shall always confine it to solutions which have also we shall, so this is preserved and for simplicity we put that the average of it is equal to zero as well as the average of the velocity potential. Okay, so we look for quasi-periodic solutions. Uh, we want to say that it is a very typical uh, phenomenon that we should expect uh, in this case uh, to have most of this kind of solutions. I remind what is it, a quasi-periodic solution. A quasi-periodic solution is a, a solution defined for all times, which has a, a specific form. So it is uh, the composition of, uh, uh, I call it N frequencies, N basic independent frequencies. So it's a composition of uh, a function u which depends on uh, new angles. So these are new angles, uh, which is, uh, they belongs to Tn. So the function u is a uh, 2 pi periodic uh, in phi 1, 2 pi periodic in phi n, composed uh, with uh, the linear flow, namely so each of these variables uh, have uh, a rotation with frequency omega 1, omega 2, and omega n. Of course, so when n is equal to 1, <laughs> there is only one frequency. These are periodic functions uh, with frequency omega period to pi over omega. And so these are the uh, interactions of more superpositions of more uh, frequencies, uh, omega of uh, circular frequencies with frequency omega 1, omega n. So uh, if one has, okay, w the frequency omega in order to be really uh, quasi-periodic has to be independent. So we assume that uh, the vector omega has no integer relations, so omega dot k is different for zero for, for all uh, integer scale in z nu, z n, which are of course not zero. So solutions uh, of this kind of solutions global, global in time, defined for all times, uh, and uh, from then uh, it means that in the phase space uh, there exists uh, uh, a manifold parameterized by and angles, so in a certain phase space, in three dimensional phase space, if uh, the solution, the initial datum starts here, then uh, the solution will remain forever on this manifold, and actually the flow 
applied to this initial datum will be nothing but, it remains that it is nothing but just the rotation of, for the linear flow, omega t. So the dynamics are restricted on this, the dynamics of the initial data restricted on these manifolds is just uh, the linear flow, just the translations. And, uh, okay, <coughs> we look for uh, solutions of small amplitude. And so, of course, uh, it is uh, relevant to know what is the dynamics of the linearized equation at uh, flat ocean eta is equal to zero with uh, zero velocity, psi is equal to zero. We linearize uh, the Euler equation and we get this system, which is this constant coefficient system, where g of z, the Schiller normal operator of the flat surface, is just uh, the Fourier multiplier modulus of the x. And then uh, one look for its solutions. Actually, so these are all uh, its uh, uh, linear, uh, are all the standing wave solutions, which are even reversible for this linear equation. So they are even in x. So we have expanding the basis, basis of cosinus of jx, avoiding the average in space, so j greater or equal to 1. The first component uh, in time uh, is uh, even. The velocity potential in time is odd. Xij are polar meters. <coughs> so the linear uh, equation actually has uh, this uh, structure. All the solutions of the linear equation have this structure, are of this form here. <laughs> even with an infinite dimensional torus, here with infinitely many frequencies, because here I put the series for j greater or equal to 1. And uh, <coughs> this kind of non-resonance conditions, on the contrary, of course, it will depend on the linear frequencies, on the values of uh, the parameters, gravity and uh, surface tension. According to the values of g and k, there are different non-resonance conditions. And the question that uh, we we pose uh, is to know actually whether these uh, solutions of the linear equation can be continued uh, holes for the solutions of the full uh, nonlinear equation for small amplitude. So the problem uh, is uh, quite uh, involved uh, and so in fact uh, we shall continue solutions uh, which are f supported in Fourier space uh, on finitely ma many modes. Namely we take finitely many indices integers, j1 bar, j n bar. And then we look at solutions which are supported in Fourier on these uh, sites. The other modes are at rest, zero. <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> rephrasing, uh, in this case, uh, the, the linear equation has uh, uh, invariant tori, which are explicitly this one, parameterized by the angles phi1, phi2, phi n. Uh, which support uh, the frequencies, uh, which are now, in fact, uh, the, the, the vector omega of the linear frequencies, which is this one. Now, it is uh, intuitive, it's also well known uh, from uh, mechanics and uh, since uh, 100 years, uh, even more, that uh, are relevant, uh, well, no, less because the Kolmogorov theorem is after the Second War, but that uh, what is, uh, what one, it would be important to know whether these solutions will persist under perturbation is to know whether the linear frequencies of oscillations satisfies suitable strongly non-resonance conditions. And in particular, for if the frequency vector satisfies the conditions for which uh, omega dot an integer L is uh, not only different from zero, but from a quantitative point of view, it, is, uh, it has a lower bound of this type here, which is uh, so-called the Diffantin conditions. And uh, the point here is that uh, uh, the linear frequencies that uh, I recall here are, uh, so the linear frequencies depends on G and K and R. I wrote in the previous slides, so R. J. The linear frequencies <coughs> Indeed, one can show that uh, uh, for most values, uh, for example, of fixing j, for most values of the surface tension parameter, this vector, this n-dimensional vector, actually fulfills these conditions. 
so that uh, along the curve, omega kappa, the vector indeed meets, encounters a lot of uh, uh, points where these conditions are fulfilled. So at least the initial, uh, it's uh, the initial um, starting point in order to hope for the con that uh, the solutions will persist also in the nonlinear system is satisfied. So here we are in a situation in which we have the, the linear system, which is like an integrable system, and the nonlinearity for small amplitude solutions is seen as a perturbation. So this kind of problem has been studied considerably in the last, uh, say, 30 years under the name of KM theory, which has been uh, quite developed for semilinear equations by many people. And, uh, but in fact, uh, we started starting uh, since uh, a lot of years, uh, the motivated especially from water waves, uh, the issue of uh, quasi-linear PD, because in fact most of the equations are of this type. And uh, the first results uh, that uh, obtained with uh, Pietro Baldi and Riccardo Montalto for of KM type results uh, concerning in fact uh, KDV equations uh, plus uh, a quasi-linear small perturbations. And uh, then in fact uh, the, deve the further development of this uh, strategy, uh, it is uh, what uh, I will describe uh, in part uh, for uh, the water waves. Okay, so for water waves, uh, uh, there are, uh, were already known uh, some results of periodic solutions, starting from a series of remarkable works by Toland, Plotnikov, and the Jos Plotnikov Toland in different cases. So when uh, uh, first, uh, where uh, the first work uh, was in the case uh, for always for standing waves, finite ocean, and uh, in the case of a finite uh, fluid, the first results proved, and without capillarity, the first results uh, proved the existence of periodic solutions, finite depth only under the action of gravity, and then uh, uh, Jos of toland is the case of more difficult case of infinite depth. In this case, it is more difficult because it is, uh, uh, okay, there is a degeneracy in the kernel, and then uh, still uh, with uh, only gravity. The case uh, with the capillarity, in fact, uh, which is exactly this case, uh, has been uh, solved by Alazar and Baldi, proving uh, exactly for this system periodic solutions in time. Uh, and then uh, there are also some related results uh, of uh, traveling wave solutions, uh, which uh, by Craig Nichols and Jos Plotnikov, which uh, in higher space dimension. I think that the traveling waves in dimension two, I think, the periodic is Levi Civita, if I'm not wrong. But uh, okay, I, it is not a small device or problem. And so, okay, the natural question is exactly continuing uh, the result by Alazar Baldi to look whether quasi-periodic solutions exist. They proved periodic, and we would like to see that. Okay, so for concerning quasi-periodic solutions, uh, uh, previous works, which uh, tried to understand what is the effect uh, of uh, derivatives in the nonlinearity under uh, uh, for uh, vector fields where the perturbation contains derivatives uh, was done by Cookson first and Kappler Peschel, KDV adding uh, one derivative. This uh, is of course still a semi-linear equation because there is just one derivative in the perturbation concern with respect to KDV. And then uh, for NLS, uh, for the Klein-Gordon equation there was a work by Bourguin for periodic solutions. Uh, this is uh, some sense more difficult because it is less dispersive equation and then uh, it's a bit more difficult. And then uh, with Luca Biasco and Michele Procesi, we had given a general result of quasi-periodic solutions for uh, still uh, Klein-Gordon equations with semilinear perturbations. Perturbations so with, uh, where the vector fields depends on one derivative in time and one derivative in space. And uh, one has to assume a structure, which is algebraic structure, which is relevant, uh, which is a reversibility. This is, uh, I have no idea about a possible Hamiltonian structure of this equation, but it is natural to expect a reversible structure. The reversible structure, it is a, a structure which uh, is compatible with the presence of uh, quasi-periodic solutions, uh, 
to control the growth of Sobolev norms uh, and uh, as we saw also yesterday. For quasi-linear equations, in fact, um, as I mentioned before, the first results uh, we obtained with Pietro Baldi and Riccardo Montalto concerned uh, KDV plus then one add an Hamiltonian perturbation which has uh, three derivatives, so it is quasi-linear, so which is generated by an Hamiltonian where the density depends uh, again on one space derivative. And then uh, you want, when writing down the vector field, the Hamiltonian vector field, one reads that it is the, has this shape, so it is a quasi-linear system. So now well, let's go back to water waves and I wanted to ex precisely give the result uh, of quasi-periodic solutions in this uh, system, for this system. So these are again the equations and it's an autonomous system. So the quasi-periodic solution, the, the, the frequencies of the quasi-periodic solutions is not fixed a priori. It will change according uh, to the non-linearity when uh, and according to the amplitude. So if uh, the solutions will tend to zero, the non-linearity will determine, uh, will have effect on the frequencies. So we look for quasi-periodic solutions with frequency omega tilde, which are uh, unknown, which are uh, to be found. Uh, okay, and then the theorem uh, is this one, namely the statement uh, is the usual result that one could expect, namely there exist quasi-periodic solutions. The quasi-periodic solutions of this system uh, are done in the following way. As I said, uh, take any arbitrary finite subset of indices, S, let J1, J2 bar, Jn bar. Then uh, the quasi-periodic solutions uh, are in space, uh, in Fourier space, mainly supported uh, on these harmonics, uh, cosinus of Jx. <coughs> They're mainly, the amplitudes are mainly, uh, the main part of the oscillation is described by the linear equation. In fact, are these ones. But uh, the frequencies are shifted. In fact, uh, there will be a shift in the frequencies, omega j tilde. The frequencies omega j tilde will tend to the linear frequencies of oscillations when the amplitude the xi tends to zero. So when xi tends to zero, the frequencies will converge to these ones. The frequencies omega j tilde, as I said before, has to satisfy sweet, strong, suitable non-resonance conditions. As a consequence, uh, the solutions uh, do not exist for all the values of the parameters, but they exist uh, for most values of these parameters. And uh, we say like that, that in fact, so for most values of uh, surface tension parameter, for example, considering the gravity G is equal to one, the solutions in fact uh, exist. So are quasi-periodic solutions uh, and uh, an extremely important uh, property for the proof, not only because it is interesting from a dynamical <laughs> point of view, but also for the proof is that we know that uh, these solutions are linearly stable. I want to explain now what I mean. Uh, it is linearly stable really in the meaning uh, of uh, dynamical systems. I, will, uh, I have a slides on it. So this uh, is the typical result that one can expect. One can, of course, also rephrase uh, the results uh, saying uh, one can take uh, for most values of the surface tension parameter, fixed, one fixed equation, for most values of xi, there exist solutions of uh, that fixed equation. Now, some comments, very uh, natural. Well, the first is that uh, the fact that uh, there are these restrictions is not technical. There are these restrictions on the parameters. It's not technical. Because otherwise uh, one should expect completely different phenomena. This is the typical situation that one should encounter, say, in uh, Hamiltonian systems. In, uh, here, Namely, uh, outside uh, there are resonance phenomena that destroy the, uh, destroy the solutions. And uh, there are completely different uh, solutions kind of solutions. And uh, now the, uh, the system that has been described before, in fact, uh, uh, even probably a formal proof lacks, but uh, is lacking, but it is uh, not integrable, uh, almost surely. I don't know. 
Walter will enter with comment on it. And uh, for example, also if one looks at the dynamics of the third order system, approximated system, there are uh, there can be sources of instabilities and there can be a resonant uh, dynamics uh, called the Wilton ripples. And uh, so these values uh, of the para the choice of these values of the parameters G and kappa, of course, uh, avoids uh, controls uh, avoids uh, these uh, effects. Is the choice for which one does not uh, see these uh, insta instability phenomena. And similarly, the, was the in fact as we heard in the talk of Jean-Marc yesterday, for most values of uh, G and kappa. Uh, solutions with an initial zero potential uh, exist for all, for, for a long time. We don't know if uh, solutions uh, exist for all times. And so in some sense, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in the previous theorem, one in fact is uh, selecting initial conditions for which actually the solution avoids forever all the resonances and so is uh, survive uh, in some sense for all times. Maybe in between uh, there can be regions where on the contrary it can be blow up, or actually probably, <laughs> and would be this uh, other kind of dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so this is the picture, very natural picture that one could expect of the complicated dynamics between uh, stability, KM, and then uh, hyperbolic orbits, horseshoes, and uh, very complicated same thing. OK, so I said uh, that uh, the quasi-periodic solutions that we found are linearly stable. They are linearly stable really in the sense uh, of uh, uh, dynamical systems, uh, really in the sense that uh, in the following sense. OK, uh, in a suitable set of coordinates, uh, the linearized system that I unfortunately have not written, so I write it. So, OK. So uh, in the sense of dynamical systems, I mean that so we have an Hamiltonian system, ut gradient of u, and then we'll, we have a solution of time. In this case, it is a quasi-periodic solution. And then we linearize the vector field. We linearize at these solutions, at this solution, the system, at this solution. And then we have an equation which is, of course, linear with the time-dependent quasi-periodic coefficients. So this is a, a linear operator, which depends on time here in a quasi-periodic way. And the linear stability is that, uh, okay, of course, the dynamics of an object like this uh, can be very complicated, and the, the whole point the main point of all the proof is that uh, we are able to, uh, con to control completely this operator. Actually, we diagonalize it. So we are able to compute its the asymptotic expansion of all its eigenvalues, of all its flock exponents. And this is, in a sense, the core of the matter. So because uh, if of the linearized equation like this, uh, I know I am able to control X spectrum, <laughs> of course, uh, I'm able to control also the non-resonance uh, that can appear there. And in fact, so the precise statement is that uh, there exists a suitable set of coordinates, good coordinates, which integrate the system. In a suitable set of coordinates, these very complicated PD, linear PD, becomes this type is this constant coefficient system, namely, OK, phi and y are finite dimensional coordinates. They live uh, on a torus, finite dimensional torus, and they describe uh, the tangential and the normal uh, <coughs> dynamics uh, close to the torus. These are, I call it phi. Phi 1, uh, these are the angles. But then uh, uh, let me see particularly the uh, infinite dimensional part. This is a PD. So in fact, this must be a PD. And it means that uh, that PD, now forgetting the action angle uh, dynamics, is conjugated to a constant coefficient so, uh, operator decomposing V, I mean, in Fourier series as we also saw this morning. It means uh, that uh, this uh, 
really are completely diagonalized in these variables and uh, they are uh, simply harmonic oscillators with lambda j, uh, I call it mu j, which uh, are in this case real. <coughs> and for which uh, in the next slide we shall give also an asymptotic expansion of this. So because of this, so if this complicated PD, the linearized equation at the system, has been conjugated to this set, to this constant coefficient PD, so this set of infinitely many harmonic oscillators decoupled, well then of course uh, with the mu j which is a real value, then uh, of course, uh, so for example, one has the stability, the Sobolev norm of this system does not increase. Zero and uh, i mu ij are uh, what are called in the dynamical system the Floquet exponents of the solutions. The Floquet exponents of the solutions, uh, so uh, of course uh, if I know everything, uh, if I know them, well, then uh, I completely control the, everything about the dynamics nearby. And uh, what uh, in fact uh, the method uh, provides uh, an asymptotic expansion of these uh, Floquet exponents. This uh, <coughs> these uh, eigenvalues uh, have the following form. Uh, where is two? Can uh, they have the form. Uh, mu j are the unperturbed frequencies where I put the g is equal to 1, so are exactly this one with gravity is equal to 1, which have to be corrected. They are corrected by a constant, which is close to 1. And when the solution tends to 0, this constant will tend to 1. It's correct. These frequencies must converge to the linear frequencies of oscillations. Plus lower order corrections. There will be another correction, so lambda 1. At, uh, there is a by cancellations due to the symmetries of the equation, there is not the, the, the correction of order j. There is the next correction is at order one half. Again, this is another real small correction plus lower order corrections, real small. <laughs> if one wants, the method would provide at any order the asymptotic expansion of this. So, the, again, the Fourier, the, so the Fourier multiplier are a perturbation, of course, as it should be, of the linear unperturbed frequencies. And that is, of course, a fundamental information because uh, it allows really to control under perturbation the nearby dynamics. The second information con concerns uh, <coughs> the change of variables. So I said that uh, one can conjugate this linear PD to this uh, constant coefficient, uh, to, to this system. Through a change of variables, I have to control this. And the point is that uh, this change of variables actually maps uh, Sobolev spaces uh, Hs uh, into themselves uh, for any s, however large it is. Why this is a relevant information? Because, uh, so it means that, that essentially, if I want information of high Sobolev norms, uh, well, I can achieve uh, these conditions here, which is simple, and then uh, by the inverse change of variable, I will have, of course, uh, the informations about uh, sub the, the evolution of uh, an initial datum in Sobolev norms also for, for this one. So these are the two fundamental informations. There exists so a good, uh, there is a, a, spect a very good spectral analysis of the linearized operator. So the linearized operator is conjugated through changes of variables which maps Sobolev space into themselves for any high Sobolev norm into something into another system which is uh, diagonalized and uh, we control in a constructive way, in a very precise way, all uh, the asymptotic expansion of the eigenvalues. It's clear that uh, <laughs> these informations uh, uh, enables uh, to control and uh, to overcome uh, the small divisor difficulties. Okay, this uh, is a uh, 
a, a, an easy explanation why this is a small divisor difficulty, I rephrase it, uh, why, why this is a small divisor problem, I rephrase it, uh, suppose that we look for zeros of this uh, uh, nonlinear function, those of this nonlinear operator, where one look for the an embedding, so one looks for an embedding <coughs> of the solutions, replacing uh, dt with the omega dot d phi, so dt that becomes in quasi-periodic sexing omega dot d phi, so one looks, one needs to look for zeros of this uh, operator. When u is equal to zero, because we want small amplitude solutions, we, we start uh, from the flat ocean with the zero velocity, potential, and then uh, for the implicit function theorem we want to find uh, eta and the psi has a function of uh, uh, the other parameters, kappa, omega, and then uh, one is interested in the linearized the, the operator, which is essentially what we did before, and this operator uh, is this one, uh, constant coefficients in Fourier space can be, is diagonalized in this way, but uh, then, of course, uh, we see the difficulty that we mentioned uh, before, namely this, uh, the determinant of these uh, matrices are these ones. And uh, here L is an integer, J is any integer, so these numbers always will accumulate to zero. And one can impose uh, for most values of frequencies omega and parameters kappa lower bound on, on this type, so that the linearized operator is invertible, but it's inverse operator because of the resonance effects, it loses derivatives, and uh, so this is the, the usual uh, small divisor problem. Because of the, of the resonances, uh, the inverse, it is uh, the, the continuation of these orbits, it is uh, not uh, based on contraction. And then a, a way to solve this problem is uh, through Nash-Moser implicit function theorem, which is, uh, as it is well known, it is based on a Newton method for uh, looking at the zeros of uh, a function, given an approximate solution un, one look for a better approximation, un plus one, in such a way that <coughs> is obtained by the intersection with the tangency, and this is the iterative scheme. But in fact, uh, and the, the advantage of this scheme is, uh, as it is well known, it is a quadratic scheme. So the distance between two successive approximations is less or equal than the square of uh, the distance between two previous one. This uh, super quadratic, uh, this quadratic speed of convergence enabled to compensate the small divisor difficulties. But the difficulty is uh, that in order to write, for example, the scheme, I, we need to know the linearized operator at uh, a function u, which is not only zero, but uh, u different from zero. And so we are in fact encountering for here, in this problem here. The problem is to show that uh, the linearized operator is invertible for most values of the parameters, and that its inverse satisfies estimates, uh, say, tame, namely that uh, they map a Sobolev norm, there can be a fixed loss, and it must be tame uh, with respect to the point u where we linearize. And this is uh, the difficulty is that when one writes the linearized operator for the water waves, it has uh, a bad shape, at least, uh, well, this is the form, uh, where, uh, so here, g of it is the Dirichlet norm operator, b and v are functions, which are the gradient of the velocity potential at the free surface. Uh, okay, and so it is, uh, the point is, okay, this is exactly this uh, operator here, and we would like to invert and to prove that uh, it, the, uh, for most values of uh, parameters and to prove estimates for the inverse. And so the proof uh, is quite, uh, is composed of many arguments. I will not uh, discuss, uh, of course, all. But uh, okay, there is a Nash-Moser proof that uh, we formulate uh, as a theorem of hypothetic conjugation of Hermann in order to, to take uh, with, uh, the with the parameters, but then uh, I will discuss a bit more uh, this part here, namely the analysis of the linearized PD, because of course uh, from this is uh, an essential PD part. Okay, about parameters, I ju just say two things. Uh, of course, uh, as we said, uh, parameter, uh, all these phenomena, as we all know since a long time, uh, really depends uh, on a very complicated way on uh, 
Cantor set of parameters, there are fractal, uh, fractals which appear, there are very complicated chaotic dynamics. And uh, so really it's very sensitive to know uh, no re how to fulfill, to verify no resonance conditions of the Fantine type. And uh, in fact, uh, the first Kolmogorov result uh, worked for, uh, with a st very strong uh, non-degeneracy condition that, for example, was not satisfied in uh, celestial mechanics for the, for the, Kolmogor for the solar system, and uh, as Kolmogorov knew. And then, in fact, uh, this, uh, for example, was the motivation of uh, weaker non-degeneracy conditions, particularly for by Hermann. And uh, then there is the result by Fejos about uh, uh, the solar system, we where are satisfied the weaker non-resonance conditions. Here, I want to discuss. Here we use, uh, <coughs> we can use the surface tension parameter, or physically from a physical point of view, which is also equivalent. Uh, we can uh, fix kappa and uh, consider uh, as a parameter the wavelength. Maybe here I put uh, two pi, but. Uh, 2 pi lambda is um, another parameter which enters in a non-trivial way. So I fix the equation, the solutions will exist for most values of the wave lambda of the, um, of the wavelength. And it is uh, essentially the same. Or one could think also to the, to the, depth, to the depth of the ocean, for example. Uh, okay, in this case, uh, <coughs> the the ingredients which are uh, what we use, which are important to verify these weak non-degeneracy conditions, are the fact that uh, these linear frequencies are indeed the analytic functions of, uh, say, surface tension, and uh, they satisfy suitable asymptotics at infinity, <laughs> square root of j kappa j three half. And then uh, there is a suitable non-degeneracy conditions, a non-triviality condition that I explain now which is in fact the uh, it's called the torsion condition which uh, i think uh, goes back uh, to i don't know precisely it appears uh, in uh, herman but also probably in uh, other russian people and um, it is uh, just says that uh, <coughs> if one takes uh, the frequencies one looks at the map from the say r into Rn, then uh, the image is not contained in any hyperplane. So it is a torsion condition, tells that uh, the curve omega kappa, is, which is analytic, is not identically contained into an hyperplane. So analytically for any vector c, in Rn, not zero, the function C scalar product omega kappa is not identically zero. So it is not contained in any hyperplane that is called the torsion condition. And uh, the proof uh, in this case, in fact, it's a computation. Uh, one takes uh, the frequency vector and uh, one shows that it is not contained in any hyperplane. And one shows that uh, these vectors are indeed obtained by differentiations, are indeed linearly independent. Uh, from here it comes out the van der, van der Mond determinant, and then uh, one check that uh, this con non degeneracy conditions is fulfilled. Then, uh, okay, <coughs> this is what I say about uh, parameters. And then uh, I start make a bit the PD part. The PD part, uh, as I said, concern uh, the analysis the spectral analysis of this uh, linear time, time and space dependent operator, which is the obtained in this way. And uh, I repeat that the goal uh, is to find a conjugation, suitable change of variables phi, which conjugated this uh, to an operator in a very simple operator here. Ah, okay, here I have already uh, put in uh, the operator restricted to the directions which are normal to the tangential dynamics. So, okay. And uh, I said that the core is to compute uh, this asymptotic expansion of the eigenvalues. 
And uh, in the same spirit of uh, the talk of Jean Marc, this is done uh, in two conceptually different uh, um, steps. The first step has the goal not to reduce the size of, uh, because this is a constant coefficient plus epsilon terms. But uh, the first step will be not to worry about the epsilon things and to make them epsilon square and so on, but first uh, to reduce it to constant coefficients up to smoother terms. Which is irrelevant because uh, when uh, here there are quasi-linear effects uh, on high frequencies, uh, uh, J3 half is extremely large <laughs> and uh, that is important if you don't control it uh, that it is uh, the real biggest <laughs> contribution to the dynamics. So the first step uh, is uh, to put to constant coefficients as it is here the highest order terms. Lambda 3 at order 3 half constant and then also will disappear the order 1 here again by the symmetry of reversibility and uh, then uh, the order dx 1 half which is also an unbounded contribution, one has to put to constant coefficients. When one reaches the order zero, okay, that it is uh, sufficiently uh, mild. In fact, we have down to a semi-linear situation. At this point, uh, it is natural to start uh, uh, erasing uh, terms which are epsilon, and then epsilon square, epsilon three, and so on, namely to perform, say, a normal form analysis, uh, removing sites. So these are the two steps. First, to reduce uh, to constant coefficients in decreasing symbols, and then uh, at that point uh, to reduce uh, the size of the perturbation to diagonalize. The effect of these two things will lead to this uh, representation for, the, for these uh, eigenvalues. And uh, okay, this, uh, okay it is, uh, this will be obtained by conjugations changes of variables, time-dependent changes of variable. If uh, we have a linear system, which is a linear system in this case, quasi-periodic in time, we conjugate with a change of variable, which is in this case quasi-periodic in time, then uh, it transforms into another linear system. The form of the new operator is written here. There is the conjugation of the space operator, A, just by similarity, phi minus one A phi, and then there is a term which comes from the conjugation of the dt part. dt gives uh, this contribution here. Okay, and then the goal if, uh, is to find uh, several, a, a transformation A, which uh, in fact uh, will uh, eliminate, uh, look for a suitable A, such that uh, this B does not depend on space, on time. And it is diagonal, that it is what uh, we would like to do. And so, of course, A of t is obtained by compositions of uh, several transformations, changes of variables uh, of very different nature. <coughs> the first What's the difference between A and B? So it is, uh, I start uh, from a system A, I make a change of variable, and uh, I obtain a new system. This is a change of variable, <laughs> nothing that a, a very general change of variable. <laughs> that is the rule of the how changes the part of time and the part of space, and oh. then uh, I will choose A in order to... Uh, so now you want to make B like constant? I would like to do that, yes. I don't do it in one step, but in a lot of steps. I think you meant to say you, change, you choose phi to make it... Ah, yes, yes, sorry, sorry. I said I want to say I choose phi, the change of variable. No, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so of course I look at the change of variable so that the system with vector field A transform into a system with vector field B. This is just the transformation rule, nothing else. And now we have to choose in a proper way to, good, to make good things. Here there are a lot of experts. Uh, in this context, uh, we appear as the good unknown on Alinac in the following way. This is the linearized operator. In fact, it, it is the, this first step of the analysis is the same as in Eleazar Baldi. Then uh, this is the linearized operator. In uh, this, uh, with this uh, variable, the good unknown, which means uh, conjugating that system with just uh, this matrix, B, the multiplication for the function B. Well, the system obtained conjugating this uh, linear problem becomes uh, uh, this one, which is uh, much nicer symmetric. And uh, as was said by Jean-Marc yesterday, its uh, eigenvalues are, uh, in this context, purely imaginary because they have not divided by I. So the eigenvalues, uh, thanks to this good unknown, the eigenvalues uh, becomes purely imaginary. 
So this is the first change of variable. Which, uh, okay, has this uh, change of variable, okay, is, uh, have we said uh, at the beginning uh, that uh, the algebraic uh, property of the system are important? Here we try to preserve always the reversibility condition because uh, it is important, it is necessary in some sense, either the Hamiltonian, either the reversibility in order to verify uh, the existence of this kind of condition. So, so we want always to preserve this property that this transformation preserve reversibility. So the good unknown preserve reversibility. Actually, this, uh, the linear version preserve also the simplectic <laughs> <laughs> nature, so we could also, but nevertheless, uh, uh, reversibility is sufficient and uh, to preserve always the simplectic character of the transformation is a bit more complicated. Could be done, but. And then uh, again, as in al Zarbaldi, there are some changes of variables uh, which are conjugate uh, diffeomorphism of the torus and the reparameterization of time, uh, such that uh, are able after this change of variable uh, to put it to constant coefficient in the highest order term. Uh, I have no time now to explain it, but uh, one has obtained the goal at highest order. And then, uh, Okay, one has uh, still some job to do. This, in fact, is not an equation, but it's a system in H, H bar. And uh, the then uh, a bit also has a, the next goal is to symmetrize, name at least at two smoothing operators. So to eliminate uh, the off diagonal terms which act on the component H bar to push. Uh, to, so to, uh, to push to very negative order, so symmetrization up to very smoothing operator, so that the new system will be constant coefficient, still variable coefficients uh, on the term which are act on H, diagonal ones, but then uh, the off diagonal terms in H bar becomes extremely smoothing. I will uh, say something later. And then uh, next goal uh, we want uh, to uh, we have uh, now the effect of, uh, at the first order, there is still variable coefficients. So in order to do this, uh, uh, we conjugate with the flow uh, produced by pseudo PD like this one. And uh, the flow of a pseudo PD like this one, since with A, which is real valued, is um, well posed between HS into HS, is nice, it is tame, and then uh, uh, by conjugation, uh, the, the conjugated operator, we wanted to analyze it. Well, it satisfies uh, this uh, Heisenberg equation. This is well, essentially the Lie method. And then uh, this equation has uh, a solution that can be solved into decreasing symbols, uh, thanks to the fact that the commutator, in fact, gains one derivatives. And uh, because of this, uh, one can solve this equation and find the conjugated operator in decreasing symbols. The new term in front of the x is, va is modified, and then one chooses the function a of x in order to put this uh, to constant. It turns out that one can put it to zero. Okay, and the same for the conjugation of time. How much time I have? One minute finished. Okay, and then, uh, well, that is a bit technical, but uh, I won't, maybe I say it. Uh, no, I don't say nothing. And then uh, just one word. So uh, after this conjugation to constant, we wanted to decrease the sides. At this point, we are in a semi-linear situation. And then uh, the transformation, the analog of the normal form is this one. We want now to find uh, transformations which decrease uh, the perturbation from sides epsilon to sides epsilon square. So one conjugate uh, with the flow of uh, a function w to be found. The new operator can be analyzed again uh, as before, but then we expand really in powers of epsilon, and then uh, we look at the new, at the new uh, epsilon term. And then we want to choose w so that uh, this term disappears. In doing this, uh, uh, one solve it, and one uh, is able to do it if uh, this function w and w1 are obtained in this way from the perturbation, one has to divide through differences of the again, sum and differences of the eigenvalues, and so appears that it is necessary to impose in this diagonalization pro pro progress, pro um, in this diagonalization process, uh, one has to impose, verify these conditions, which in literature are known as the 
second order Melnikov of non-resonance conditions, if one is able to do this, one finally will obtain this diagonalization. And then finished.